the poof it's called the <laughs> what like the soof but like the soof but it's the poof the pre orbicular oculi fat pad Welcome to the Aesthetics Mastery Show. I'm Dr. Tim Pierce. Hi, I'm Miranda Pierce. And today we're talking about injecting the nasolabial fold or the piriform fossa or Rousseau space, different names for the same thing um, in many ways. So we're going to talk about injection and safety because this topic comes up a lot. I've certainly pe seen people raging online about one technique versus the other, which is safest and which is just suicide. That's how it's often phrased, but there are lots of ways to look at this area. We're going to go into in some detail to help you decide what the safest technique is to use for your patients. So why is this area important? So super important part of aesthetics because it's one of the key parts of the face that shows aging quite early on. So I think you can often see this on a 38 year old. You can see the process happening. So the nasolabial fold is a uh, almost a hinge point on the face. So it's also a place where they're relatively, it's relatively mobile with a couple of ligaments, but it, it becomes as the cheek descends as you get older and as it loses volume, um, it starts to become a, a point where the skin flexes and also where even the three-dimensional shape of the cheek um, and the mid face can change. So it's, it's a place many injectors will look at treating relatively early on. Um, people are way better these days at treating the cheek as well at the same time. Um, but it's, it's, that, it's that important aspect that it's early and significant in terms of aging of the mid face. Tell me more about the anatomy. So um, the space itself uh, was first defi defined by Rousseau and it has multiple boundaries that you can use and it's, it's a potential space. And what this means is there, is there is a legitimate area of opening that you can create and it's also an area of opening that gets bigger as you age and it's defined by several structures around the face. Firstly, on the inferior border, it's the, the, the poof it's called. The... <laughs> what? Like the soof, but... Like the soof, but it's the poof. The pre orbicularis oculi fat pad. How have I never heard of that? People don't talk about the poof that much, but it's there. Pre orbicularis oculi fat pad. Orbicularis oris fat pad. So this is the fat pad that's behind the Sorry. muscle that you move with. So the pre orbicularis oculi fat pad is the inferior border. Um, you have obviously the muscle just above. Just medial to that, the most medial part of the space is the depressor nasi muscle. So this muscle is just the one that pulls your nose down. Um, laterally, you have the deep medial fat pad and then the muscles that pass over it. So the, these are important because just above the muscles is also the fat pad and this is where the artery runs just over the surf, over the roof of the, um, of the space. So the depths are really important, the three-dimensional anatomy is really important and I was going to show that to you on this little model here today. Okay, so this the piriform fossa, which lies next to the piriform aperture, gets its name from this aperture. So right next to the aperture, uh, by the way, piriform means pear-shaped. So all it means is it's the shape of the pear. And of course, uh, we like to think of fancy names. Whoops, I've knocked off the depressor septi. And the little fossa, the little indentation next to the piriform aperture is the area that has a potential space. This means you can, you can inflate it. And, um, some experiments have been done where they put air and also filler into it, and it tends to fill this space. Um, it's a discrete uh, space with several different boundaries that hold it. So importantly, inferiorly, you've got the orbicular oculi fat pad underneath it, the poof, as we talked about. Um, then medially, you've got the depressor septi as one of the boundaries. So that's fallen off this model. I'm going to stick it back on. That's the medial boundary. And then over the roof of this potential space is where the fat pad is and the and the artery. So it's very important. You can see by this structure here, the facial artery and it becomes the angular artery runs over this space. So as we as we roll back the fat pad, you can see where the space is. Um, and this is really where we should be injecting um, over here. But the point that's also really worth understanding is if I remove this structure, which represents the piriform fossa, you can see in the superior lateral aspect of it, there are probably a few strands near the bone of the infraorbital artery. So these are the two arteries that can be injured when you're injecting here. You have with this laid on top, you have the facial artery where it becomes the angular artery and then underneath it more superiorly and laterally, you are very close 
to the infraorbital artery. And those are the important areas to understand because obviously injury is our primary thing not to avoid. You also have the nerves that supply the top of the lip. So you will often find patients find this a little bit uncomfortable if you just touch the, the nerve here, but that is a safer way of injecting in many ways um, than injecting more superficially, which we're gonna discuss in some detail. So that's the key anatomy. Um, and that's the place where we're attempting to fill. So it's important to fill the piriform fossa when aging has started to show in that way. And the reason aging demonstrates itself in the piriform fossa is because of bone loss, number one, and fat loss, number two. And then thirdly, when you've lost a little bit of bone and fat, you tend to, the muscles tend to become hyperdynamic. So there's, that means they move more um, as you get older, you get almost caricaturish. So by stabilizing that area, by revolumizing it, you're going to also provide some support for the muscles that support the lip. So you can sometimes give a little bit of an elevation to the to the top lip um, in certain cases. Um, and this also will create a more natural movement or a, a more harmonious movement when the patient smiles. So it's also a way that you can treat the uh, gummy smile. Um, and it will also partly support the cheek. Now, I don't, most people wouldn't recommend using this injection to support the cheek, but it's one of the, like I would say, a push and a pull go really well together. So we need a little bit of a push and a little bit of pull, and this is the support underneath. So you can elevate the mid face by using that area. So there's several reasons to treat, um, and all of them obviously need to assess your patient carefully, but they're all reasonable um, reasons to inject there. So how do you decide on the best technique to use? So best technique is always a combination of efficacy and safety. You can't just choose safety, otherwise the safest thing is not to inject anyone ever. So there's always a balance to be had between what is a safe and what is effective. Um, it softens is the way that you can think of a safer way of doing it, but it might be so much less effective that you may not decide not to do it. So um, this is why it's the combination of those two. The anatomy, the thing we're trying to avoid is primarily the facial artery, because that's the biggest artery in that area, and it's probably the one you're closest to. And we need to avoid that um, you can avoid that either by using a, possibly using a cannula makes it safer, but certainly using a needle at the right depth makes it safer. So this is kind of where my brain's going is like, how do I avoid blocking that artery? Um, and there are multiple ways. You can be too superficial for it, too deep for it, um, or using an instrument that's less likely to penetrate it. Um, now, so then the next question becomes, what's the most effective type of injection? And this is very hard to prove. It's one of those things that's very much about the individual injector's experience. Um, you can prove where the filler goes, but the value for money, the impact it has is something that you get a feel for. My experience with injecting the piriform fossa is you it is much more effective. It feels more stable to me. I think it lasts a bit longer um, you, using a deep injection onto the periosteum. The other approach that I might use might be with a cannula, um, but my experience is it seems to be less effective and it is lying usually a little bit more superficial um, in the fat rather than on the periosteum when you use a cannula, um, and that just has a couple of downsides to it in terms of tissue integration and stability, uh, in my experience. So um, for those reasons, I probably use the needle on the bone technique a little bit more um, than cannula. It depends what else I'm doing on the face. Uh, it's, it's often appropriate in different people and in more, uh, more holistic treatments to use the cannula as well, um, but that's the one I currently use the most. The way that I was taught many years ago was basically to inject just underneath the dermis. And this has definitely gone out of, out of fashion. And it's basically because you have the infraalar artery, a branch of the facial artery um, that comes up just under the nose. It's pretty vulnerable if you're at the wrong level here. And similarly, the facial artery itself is a bit more vulnerable when you're at intermediate depths. So for most injectors, there's one thing you do get by going deep is when you touch the bone, you know exactly what level you're at. There's no doubt. Um, and there are some pros and cons with, with this, this injection technique, but one of the good things is you should know where you are, at least in terms of depth, with absolute certainty. Um, whereas new injectors, I find they are two or three millimeters out very easy because their resolution, you haven't thought about these things for a long time, for in, in as much detail. It looks pretty similar to the untrained eye being three millimeters deeper. Um, and there are ways to check for that with a depth check that we train people to do. Um, but it's really important that you know the depth and that's why touching the periosteum is one thing that gives you some certainty. So what are the complications in this area? So obviously blocking the facial artery and blocking the infraorbital artery are the most common complications from treating the nasolabial fold. Um, the one that I think is worth knowing about that I think is most at risk if you do the deep bolus on the periosteum is actually blocking the infraorbital artery. So I'm aware of a case where this happened. 
this was a relatively large, it's, a, it's an area where the, the amount that you use in one spot is quite high and this automatically makes it more dangerous. Anywhere where you're injecting a bolus um, in one spot, it's safe if you're not in something, but if you are in, in something, the scale of the injury is much bigger. Uh, and this is what I think happened in this particular case, which is a blockage of the infraorbital artery and then flowing back and blocking the last part of the maxillary artery, because that's where the infraorbital artery comes from. And this means damage to the blood supply to the mid face and the, na the nasopharynx and the palate. So really internal type injuries, very awful experience, and we would hate that to happen to anyone. And hopefully by watching this, it'll make you a little bit safer. I believe what happens in those cases, it's all to do with angle. And I have talked about this before, but I'll demonstrate it um, again on this. If, we... if you're injecting the piriform fossa, um, the facial artery is normally in the fat. So if you're putting the needle in like this, you should, even if you go through the artery, you should be touching the bone. So you're gonna be safer automatically as far as the facial artery is concerned. The problem with the bony injection comes when you're angled slightly up. So a good place to enter would be about here and you'd be underneath the artery. But if you're a novice injector and you angle up slightly, as you go deeper and deeper, you get more and more superior. You get closer and closer to these little vessels um, where the infraorbital artery enters. And if you, happen to land on one of them, and they are deeper. I've seen this on, cadaver, on cadavers. You'll find them deeper than the other vessels because they, they do emerge from the periosteum, and then you might block that maxillary artery. So it's very important that your angle is correct. So it's this sort of angle, I mean, that changes everything. If you're angled up slightly, and this can just be that you're standing in a different position on the bed, and it doesn't take much, much to it, but you really want to make sure that you're angled in such a way that as you get deeper, you get further away from the infraorbital um, artery rather than closer to it. So that's a good way of thinking about it. If I go in at this angle, I'm getting closer the deeper I get. If I go in at this angle, I'm getting further the deeper I get. And that should help you stay safer and avoid blocking that blood vessel. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you learned a thing or two about the piriform fossa. Let me know what you think in the comments and we will see you next week. And don't forget, if you are commuting or doing the dinner, please do listen to us in podcast form on Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts. Take care.